Welcome back to Math for Game Dev. For those of you hopping in for the first time, this is the series in which I cover math that I've found invaluable in my time as a game dev. I'll be covering each topic through the demonstration of specific examples, focusing on the thought process behind how I approach a problem. For the entire course overview, check out the first episode. This is the first actual math episode, and in it I'll be covering graphing curves and algebra. If you're watching this video and you want a more in-depth dive on algebra, check out other resources. Search for stuff using the phrase basic algebra course lectures or introduction to algebra lectures. There are plenty of videos and notes online and hopefully not all of them will bore you to death. I did some quick YouTube searching myself, and I'll link a video that I found that is admittedly about 40 minutes, but very comprehensive and doesn't get too caught up in the weeds, which I think is good for any of you unfamiliar with algebra. So here's today's scenario. Say we're making a side-scrolling platformer similar to Super Mario Bros right here, with a jump that's mostly physics simulated, except that the fall is faster than the rise, and the player can hold down the jump button for a higher jump. And of course, as game devs, we want a way to set the maximum jump height in editor without having to test out a bunch of values, and we want it to work regardless of whether or not we change gravity later. So let's start off with graphing some curves before we KO this problem with algebra. Going back to the energy of the intro episode, you don't have to graph curves by hand perfectly. Hopefully my bad paint curves demonstrate that. And if you ever need a perfect graph, just go to Wolfram Alpha or some other internet graphing doohickety. Your games quality won't be determined by how well you can draw a curve by hand after all. However, it's nice to be able to do an accurate enough rough sketch to get the general idea of whatever it is you're going to be graphing. Now as a lazy math enthusiast, I looked up the kinematic equations, which are the equations that describe movement, and the formula for projectile height over time. The kinematic equations tell us that speed is equal to acceleration times time plus initial speed, which in our case is speed is equal to gravity gravity times time, and from the projectile height over time we find that h of t is equal to 1 half times gravity times time squared plus the initial speed times time plus the initial height. Now some of you may be asking, why is there a t in parentheses next to h? We do that to show that height is varying with respect to time, which we denote with the variable t. So if we were to graph this out, we would put t on the horizontal axis, that is the axis that goes left and right, and then we would put h of t on the vertical axis, of course the axis that goes up and down. Now we can make Make some quick changes to this formula. Since we're interested in the maximum change in height, we can let the initial height be equal to zero and then remove it from the formula entirely, getting this new formula. Height at time t is equal to half times gravity times time squared plus the initial speed times time. Now going back to our problem, I want to be able to set the starting jump speed given a target height, and I want that value to be gravity agnostic, meaning if I changed gravity later, I still want the player to have the same max jump height. Now you might be saying, gravity? This sounds like a physics problem, and it could be if you wanted to, but let's just graph things out for now and maybe we'll find a solution. So let's start off by graphing height over time. Of course we've got a bunch of curves because, as I said earlier, the player can hold down the jump button after jumping to go higher. But we're only interested in the max jump height, so that's the only one that matters. Let's call the top of the curve, which is the maximum height the player could jump, capital H. Next, let's graph speed over time. It starts at some initial speed that we want to find, then decreases constantly over time until it reaches zero because of gravity. Then it decreases at a faster rate for negative values since we set up the jump to fall faster than it rises. And again, much like how we assigned a variable to the max jump height, let's assign the variable capital S for the initial speed of the jump. Now since things don't start falling until they stop rising, we can infer that when the graph of height over time reaches its tippy top at h is when the graph of speed over time goes from positive to negative, meaning that if we can establish the relationship between capital H and capital S and the rising gravity, we'll be able to set that up in some function and basically forget about it. So while we're here, let's figure out the time it will take for speed to go from positive to negative, which will also be the time it will take for the player to reach maximum jump height capital H. Let's replace speed over time, s of t, with zero, since we want to find the time it takes for speed to be equal to zero. 
And since we want to find t, that is time, let's get it all by itself on one side of the equation. Now a quick aside, since this is an equation, we have to maintain equality between the left hand side and the right hand side of the equal sign, meaning whatever we do to one side, we must do to the other. Now if you look at my work, I use opposite operations to remove stuff from one side entirely and place it on the other. Subtraction is the opposite of addition, division the opposite of multiplication, square root the opposite of square. Whenever in doubt, just look stuff up. Anyways, let's plug that value of t into height over time, h of t. On the left hand side of the equation, we know that since t is the time it takes for vertical speed to go from positive to negative, aka when the player stops rising and starts falling, aka the top of the jump, we know that h of capital S divided by negative g is equal to capital H, all without having to do any math. And then we plug in t is equal to capital capital S divided by negative G on the right hand side of the equation. We can group similar terms together, and since both terms on the right hand side of the equation are given in terms of capital S squared divided by G, we can group all of it together. Now just like when we were solving for time earlier, let's try getting capital S, which is the initial speed we want, all by itself on one side of the equation. After working it all out, we find the initial speed to jump a given height h under gravity g is equal to the square root of negative 2 times the height we want to jump times gravity. And don't worry about the negative sign in the square root. After all, since things fall down, our gravity term is going to be negative, meaning that the inside will be positive. But if your game engine gives gravity in terms of a positive value, well then just, you know, get rid of the negative sign, no worries. Now that we have the initial speed all by itself, we can slap that inside of our jump function so that way when the player presses the jump button, the player character starts jumping with that speed. But does that make sense? Let's do a quick sanity check. Let's say our game uses meters as its units. Height is some value in meters. Gravity is a type of acceleration, meaning it's the rate of change of speed over time. And speed is the change in position over time, meaning gravity should be given in terms of meters per second per second, or meters per second squared. And capital S should be a speed, so its units of should also be meters per second. After checking it real fast, working out all the units, we find that capital S is given in terms of meters per second, which is what we wanted. And of course, since you're making a game, you can always just check by testing it out. Now that we have the answer, let's look at how we could have made a mistake, and more importantly, how we would have known that we made a mistake. After plugging in the value for t, let's say I accidentally mess up multiplying out capital S on the velocity term. If I did that, I would get Again, we can still group similar terms together, so we would find now this looks harder to solve, but when I'm in a situation like this, I like to group all the terms on one side of the equal sign. And hopefully, some, or maybe even ideally, all of you are having a strong sense of deja vu. After all, this is the form of a quadratic equation, meaning if we replaced y with 0 and we graphed it out, it would look like a parabola. So since it's a quadratic equation, we can use the quadratic formula to solve for capital S, the initial speed we want to find. Now if alarm bells weren't ringing earlier, they should be now. The plus or minus signs means we would have two solutions instead of just one, which really doesn't make sense. Also the value inside the square root would probably be negative, meaning we would get an undefined answer. And finally if we tried checking the units, we'd find it just wouldn't make any sense. And if you find yourself in a situation like this, my only parting words are, I hope you wrote out each step clearly because a simple mistake was made somewhere. It's easy to mess up a negative sign or power somewhere, so don't worry about it. I have done it myself hundreds if not thousands of times, and I continue to make mistakes like this. It's just like messing up spelling a word. It happens, so try not to sweat it. In fact, the reason why I decided to showcase this possible mistake was because I made this mistake while working out this problem. Now some of you may be asking, we've been graphing curves and messing around with equations, when do we get to the algebra? Surprise, messing around with equations is algebra. Hopefully you saw how useful graphing in algebra can be. After all, we solved this problem without using physics or calculus.
calculus, but just by using some graphical intuition and algebra. For me, and hopefully for you, the eureka moment was realizing the relationship between the two equations by comparing their graphs, and realizing that the projectile reaches its maximum height at the same time as the speed goes from positive to negative, which is pretty obvious when I say it like that. After all, it wouldn't be the max height if it kept on going up. Now if I had to outline my general approach to this type of problem, it would be to think of what I want precisely. In this case, I want to find the given starting jump speed so the player jumps a height h under gravity g. Then I found equations that weren't precisely what I wanted but had similar things. I graphed them out so I could see how they behaved, which allowed me to see a relationship between them. After that, I used algebra to combine equations to find exactly what I wanted, and then I used it once again to make sure the answer I found wasn't crazy. Now some parting words. Math is just like any other skill. The more you do it, the more you'll develop an intuition about how to solve things. And that's it for this episode. If any of you have any questions about any terms or ideas I covered in this, leave a comment and hopefully I can help you understand or at least point you in the right direction. Hopefully I won over even you math haters with this exploration of algebra by an applied approach. Thank you for watching and I hope you have a good day. If you liked the video, please leave a like. And if you want to follow along with this math series or my devlogs once I get back to them, please subscribe. Next video will be about trigonometry, the study of the relationship between the angles and sides of a triangle. You can also follow me on Twitter at dev underscore natsu. I bake things about once a week and I post pictures of my culinary creations there once I pop them out of the oven. And speaking of baking, let's get to it. So I didn't say bread this time, I said bake because I'm, uh, and clearly this isn't bread. I'm uh, learning how to make macaroons, so, you know, and uh, as you can see, you know, it's not, not what you'd expect when you, if you Google images for macaroons. There's some cracks on it, and, you know, I tried a pastel food coloring, uh, pastel, excuse me, food coloring in this one, and it just did not, the color did not keep well enough, and so, but I mean, you know, they're still really tasty. They have a nice nougaty flavor because of the almonds. And let's look at the second pick. So I wasn't dissuaded, you know, I was determined to see it all the way through, and I made a uh, lemon curd buttercream filling for them. And uh, as some of you may know, we lost, we lost, you know, we got 12 shells. That means there should be six cookies. Yeah, I ate one of them. But yeah, the lemon curd butter cream, um, again, if you if you were paying attention to my Twitter, you know I have a bunch of lemons right now. So it's just, you know, something to play around with when while I figure it all out. And so, yeah, I... I'm, I'm going to be using a lot of lemons while I'm making these macarons, and I have been. You know, I'm I'm in the future. I'm I'm I've improved a lot based on this first example, but you'll just have to stick around and watch and see how things progress over time. But I'll use my regular sign off, even though I'm not making bread. Uh, the yeast in the air is free. You should you know either make bread or whatever some kind of baked stuff uh it's delicious it's great to share great to share with your friends and you know i'm not always the best with words so it's nice that i can make something and share it with people to show that you know i care about them and if you have troubles with words as well well this is a pretty good way to go about showing that you care all right that's it goodbye